The art of weaving has been around since the Stone Age. Traditional weavers use techniques and designs that reflect their cultural origins. Today's fashion industry has built on this tradition to produce fine wool garments. Designers keep a record of the fabrics they have created over the years. They pin samples in books based on quality, colors, and patterns for their customers to choose from. This is what cashmere goat hair looks like when it arrives at the wool mill. Short fibers called flocks go through a carding machine. This machine opens up the fibers and mixes colors together. The carding process removes impurities and reduces the fibers to a flat layer. The machine combs and twists the layer of fiber in preparation for spinning. The spinner separates the layer into threads and winds each one on bobbins of over 40 pounds. An operator loads yarn into a dyeing machine. The entire fiber drying process takes about two hours for a reel this size. Uncarded locks of hair called wool tops are used to make worsted yarn. A worker feeds the ribbon-like thread into a blending machine. The blending process merges 12 threads into one large strip. The machine recombs and twists the blended fibers, then spins them into a single strand. The coning machine winds the single thread around a cone by pulling it through a tensioning device with a series of spindles underneath. This machine can cone 20 pounds of wool in about one hour. Another spinning machine slowly unwinds worsted wool bobbins. It accelerates as the threads run through a tensioning device and onto spindles. Even though the machine processes dozens of bobbins simultaneously, this process will last several hours. The set of threads that will make up the woven cloth is called the warp. Hundreds of parallel threads wind up on this roll, called the warping machine. These rolls can stretch several miles long. The warp is now ready for weaving. This shuttle loom holds the warp under tension while it interweaves the over and under threads using two sets of weaving needles. This moving part, the beater, keeps the fabric under tension as it comes out of the loom and onto the cloth beam. This rapier loom can weave fabrics four or five times faster than an automatic shuttle loom and about 200 times faster than a hand-operated loom. The completed fabric goes to quality control. A worker performs a visual check looking for any defects in the fabric. If she finds a broken thread, she repairs it by hand. Using a sewing needle, she replaces the broken thread with a new one. Once the fabric passes quality control, it goes through a two-hour cleaning process. Then the cloth rolls through a steaming machine before accumulating at the end of the production line. The finishing process for a woven cloth can take up to a week. Designers study the fabrics and choose arrangements to make a collection. They mark selected patterns with codes and cut out samples. Then they make a sample booklet of their fabrics for customers to choose from. The fabric collection changes twice a year, providing a wide variety of styles suited to the season. 
Have you ever wondered why men's buttons are traditionally on the right side of a garment and women's on the left? Legend has it that this enabled a man to unbutton his coat with his left hand while drawing a sword with his right. Wealthy women, meanwhile, had their buttons sewn on the left side to make it easier for their right-handed maids to dress them. One way to make plastic buttons uses a multi-layer sheet of synthetic resin, hence the industry term sheet buttons. Workers start by mixing liquid polyester resin with a catalyst to gel it. They pour the material into a revolving drum which disperses it evenly. They spray a solution containing an ultraviolet pigment on this first layer only. You'll see why later on. For this particular model, they make grooves in the resin while it's still malleable. This will create a design. After about five minutes, the resin gels and they can mix and add a second layer in a different color. Besides building up the thickness of the sheet, the resin flows into the first layer's grooves, creating a design of contrasting lines. Once this second layer gels, they mix and pour in a third color. The drum spins for another 10 to 15 minutes until all layers cure. A resin sheet can be comprised of up to four different color layers. Workers can now remove the sheet. It's hardened enough to be cut into buttons, but it's still flexible enough not to crack when cut. They feed each sheet into a press that's outfitted with the die for that particular button model. The press punches out circles in the diameter of the button. These circles are called blanks. Here you can see the different color layers. The blanks move on to the machining center, where they'll be transformed into buttons. Automated equipment loads them onto carousels, with the back of the blank facing outward. How does the loader know which side is which? Remember that ultraviolet solution the workers sprayed onto the first layer of resin? A UV detector scans each blank to make sure the first layer is facing upward. If it isn't, the machine rejects the blank, then flips and reloads it. The carousels first run the back of the blank against a series of cutting heads. The heads are changed according to the model being produced. For this one, the heads gradually carve a curved back. The equipment then transfers the blank onto a second carousel, exposing the front side this time. Again, a series of cutting heads gradually carve the front of the button. The shape of this model exposes the different color layers underneath, creating a veined effect. The last cutting head drills the holes. Here you can see the full progression from blank to button. Now they polish the buttons for several hours in drums containing abrasive ceramic stones and pumice. Then workers flush the drums with water. The heavy polishing stones sink to the bottom, while the lightweight buttons float to the surface and spill out. The buttons then go into drums that contain silicone wax and thousands of tiny wooden pegs. While the drums spin, the pegs act as a carrier, distributing an even coat of wax. As the buttons exit the drums, the pegs are screened out. From here, plain buttons are often custom dyed to match fabric swatches provided by clothing manufacturers.
Archaeologists have unearthed bone buttons dating back to prehistoric times. The ancient Greeks and Romans used buttons to fasten and decorate their clothing. Europeans wore buttons strictly for adornment until about the 1200s. That's when fitted garments became the trend, fastened by a long row of buttons down the front. The rich wore buttons made of silver or gold, sometimes set with precious gemstones. Ordinary people wore buttons made of bronze or wood. This is another way to make plastic buttons using polyester resin. Only instead of turning it into sheets, they pour the resin into long metal tubes. Here, they're mixing two different colors to create a design in the plastic. The tubes go into an oven, where they bake at 212 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour, until the liquid resin hardens. Once the tubes cool off, workers remove the contents. These long resin rods will become what the industry calls rod buttons. The rods go into a machine called the slicer. Its sharp carbide blade chops the long rods into button-sized blanks. Here's what that looks like in slow motion. It's no use showing you this at regular speed. It would be but a blur. This machine cuts up to 700 blanks per minute. Blanks cut from resin rods run through the same machining center as those cut from resin sheets. In the last segment, we showed you the machining steps in slow motion. Here's what they look like at actual speed. Any type of button can be engraved with the company name or logo. They do this using a computer program laser machine. The laser beam burns the lettering into the plastic. Workers visually inspect the finished buttons to make sure that none have defects. A third way to make plastic buttons is a method called thermoset compression, a technique that combines both heat and pressure to mold the button shape. As we see here in slow motion, the raw material isn't liquid resin, but rather melamine powder. A pill-making machine, the kind pharmaceutical companies use, compresses the powder into pill-shaped blanks. Here's what that pill-making action looks like at actual speed. To transform these pills into buttons, workers load them onto a press. The press uses high pressure to force each pill into a button mold for a period of 40 to 60 seconds, depending on the size of the button. At the same time, it heats the mold to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. This bakes the melamine into hard plastic. They cool the molded buttons in a basin of cold water. Some specialty buttons will be gold-plated, but not before soaking in a chemical bath to clean their surface so that the plating will bond well. As a rule, only materials that conduct electricity can be metal-plated. Plastic, of course, is non-conductive. This company has managed to devise a way to gold-plate plastic buttons. Exactly how is a closely guarded secret it's not willing to divulge. After plating the buttons in copper, a 12-hour process, they plate them in nickel, which takes just a couple of minutes, and finally in 24-karat gold, which takes just a few seconds. A mere one ounce of gold is enough to plate 180 pounds of buttons. Thermoset compression buttons are a lower-end product used primarily for uniforms. 
sheet buttons and rod buttons are higher quality, the standard choice for every day, and higher-end clothing. Eyeglasses don't merely correct vision. They're also a fashion statement, so much so that many of today's top clothing designers produce a line of eyeglass frames. Whether you prefer plastic frames or metal ones, they come in so many different colors, sizes, and shapes that you're guaranteed to find a pair that suits you. Metal frames come in a multitude of shapes from ordinary to extraordinary. It all starts with a computerized system called a three-axis eye winding machine. A set of rollers pulls metal wire from a big spool. Then, with software-driven precision, the machine bends the wire into the shape of the frame, then cuts the end free. The lenses will fit into pre-cut grooves on the inside. A small part called the insert connects the two ends of the eye frame, holding them closed around the lens. To attach the insert, they put it in a clamp, then position the eye frame just above it. They apply a cleaning agent called flux, then filler wire. An electric current heats the wire, metal frame, and insert until they all melt and fuse together. Now they do the same to what's called the screw hinge, the piece that attaches the arm to the iframe. Again, electrically generated heat fuses the hinge to the insert. This process, similar to soldering, is called brazing. Now for the bridge, the piece over the nose that joins the two iframes. A small press bends a piece of metal into the shape of the bridge. Then a worker aligns it with the iframes in an assembly jig. This ensures the frames are perfectly straight. Brazing again melds everything together. Next comes the piece above the bridge called the brow bar. An automated machine cuts metal wire to pieces the right length, then carves grooves on the ends to enable the brow bar to fit snugly onto the top of the frames. It then bends each piece to the right shape. The brow bar now goes into position. A little flux to remove any dust or dirt that might prevent the metal from fusing properly. Then they braze the brow bar to the frame. Now come little hooks called pad arms. They hold small pads under the bridge that cushion your nose. A worker fuses the pad arms to the frames using the same brazing process as before. Now for the arms that attach to the eye frames on one end and sit on your ears on the other. The industry calls these arms temples because they're at the level of your temples when you wear the glasses. After stamping the size and company name on the inside, they fuse a hinge to each one and press a plastic sleeve on the other end. They set the arms momentarily aside while they position the lenses in the groove of the iframe. A screw keeps everything tight and intact. Now they screw an arm onto each hinge. The arms on most models have curled ends that hook over the ears for a more secure and comfortable fit. A special machine called a mechanical cam applies pressure to bend the plastic sleeves to a 45 degree angle.
These metal frame glasses are functional and fashionable. There are reports of archaeologists finding evidence of belts and buckles dating back to the 6th and 7th centuries in Britain. Decorative belt buckles appear to have been worn for the first time as symbols of status in the 1500s throughout regional Spain. Today, hand-engraved belt buckles are prized not only as fashion accessories, but as inspired examples of workmanship and art. The buckle maker welds small stainless steel rods together to form the back of the buckle. After placing them in a welding fixture, he precision welds them. Using another fixture, the buckle maker adds a center pin to the back of the buckle. After precision welding it into place, he melts the tip of the stainless steel pin into a smooth ball. This locating pin centers the belt in the buckle. The buckle maker uses a jeweler's saw to cut the shape of the buckle from heavy gauge, solid sterling silver. He stamps the company logo into the back of the buckle. Using pure silver, he solders the welded rods onto the back of the buckle, along with a stainless steel keeper tongue. He uses a jeweler's saw to cut out initials, using the font, material, and size selected by the customer. The buckle maker uses a soldering gun to apply solder to the back of the letters, which are made of gold fill, a thin layer of gold on top of brass. He carefully positions the initials on the sterling silver buckle, which has been covered with flux for the soldering phase to come. Too much solder on the back of the letters, and it could flow out onto the buckle surface. Heating the belt buckle causes the solder on the back of the letters to attach firmly to the sterling silver surface. The attachment process happens very quickly. With a polishing compound and cloth polishing wheel, he gives the buckle a brilliant shine. The buckle maker hand engraves the buckle using assorted engraving tools. He uses a shading tool to add depth to lines. He follows guidelines drawn in felt pen. The pattern engraved is chosen by the customer. The belt maker rolls out a piece of tan strap leather. Using a gauge knife, he cuts the width of leather needed to make the belt chosen by the customer. The belt maker uses a variety of tools to cut and shape the leather. He cuts the tip of the belt. He places the leather in room temperature water for about five minutes. When bubbles stop rising, the leather is saturated. After the leather has dried, he transfers a pattern from the design strip to the leather. Stamping tools allow him to stamp intricate designs. Using a swivel knife, he cuts to a depth of between a quarter to a third of the way through the leather. The initial pattern has been carved. With a beveler, he deepens and shapes the carved lines. He chooses a bar backgrounder to create leaf in the background. With a swivel knife, he makes the final decorative cuts. The belt maker applies dye to the background sections of the carved leather, completing the most intricate part of his work. He stamps in the maker's mark. Using a piece of sheepskin, he applies an oil finish to the belt. A thin paste highlights the cuts and gives the belt an antique finish. A final tan coat waterproofs the belt and helps protect it. He makes holes in the belt. The belt has a bend in it where the buckle will be attached. With Chicago screws, he attaches the buckle firmly to the belt. Ideally, the belt and buckle complement each other. 
strong and stylish, meticulously handcrafted belt buckles and belts have managed to make a clear fashion statement out of belt tightening. Socks are something we put on without thinking. But consider this. The very first socks were strips of cloth or hide wrapped around the feet. Imagine walking around in those. Thankfully, that's ancient history. And today's socks are much better for the soul. With so many styles and fibers for socks these days, it's no problem putting your best foot forward. But you have to step into this room of knitting machines to truly understand what a science sock making has become. Here's a machine with the top open so we can get a view of the knitting action. An automated whirling cylinder pulls yarn from spools through holes in metal spokes. Little hooks on the needles grab the yarn. The hooks have latches. The latches open as the hooks snare the yarn and close as they knit so you don't lose a stitch. As you can see, this machine knits socks a lot faster than grandma, sometimes making over 360 pairs a day. As the layers are added, a sock emerges from a tube at the bottom. The knitting machine is fully computerized. It automatically switches to a different color of yarn to make a stripe or a company logo. Now the machine changes gears to make a heel. It does a half rotation instead of a whole one to knit the heel shape. The needles go up and down as the latches open and the needles pick up the yarn pulling it in. Knit one, purl two. Here it is in slow motion. This is about the speed at which a human could knit at, but this machine normally runs at a speed of over 200 revolutions a minute. A tension mechanism moves back and forth, keeping the yarn from going slack and getting tangled. Now a sock shoots out of a vacuum tube, and a worker turns it inside out. She sews the toe closed and cuts off the extra fabric. Then she turns the sock right side out again, and it's sucked up by the vacuum. Next, the vacuum tube deposits the sock into a bin. The trapdoor on the end of the tube ensures that vacuum pressure isn't lost. But there's more than one way to close a sock toe, a more automated way. A worker slides the sock between two metal plates. Pressure holds them in place. Then a motorized conveyor system transports the sock to a sewing head. A blade cuts off excess fabric, and a needle goes up and down like an oil rig, stitching one row and then another as reinforcement. This automated system produces a finer seam than a sewing machine that's run manually. Now that the toe is closed, a robotic arm moves in and feeds the sock to a set of rollers. A blade pushes the sock down while the rollers turn the sock right side out. A vacuum chute fires the sock into a bin. Then it's on to the rotary dyeing machine. He loads 1,800 pairs or more depending on the size of the dyeing machine. The socks toss around in a bath of dyes, chemicals, and softeners. For athletic socks, they add antimicrobial treatment to the mix. It will help prevent fungus or bacteria that cause foot odor. Now they slide the sock onto a foot form made of polished aluminum that won't cause snags. The aluminum leg forms stretch the socks to the prescribed size as they travel down a conveyor belt into a boarding machine. The boarding machine is like a gigantic iron, and the heat seals the stretch in the nylon so the sock stays that size. Once out, a robotic arm grips the sock and pulls it off the aluminum form. It's called a stripper. Then an automated rack with protruding pins collects the socks. The worker removes them a bunch at a time, and the socks are ready for packaging. 
And then all you have to do is pull up your socks. Jeans might be the world's greatest rags to riches story. When they were first invented, nobody would be caught dead in them, except for factory workers, farmers, and tradesmen. Yet today, they're one of the most popular clothing items in the world. Quite a fashion statement. Jeans are made from a highly rugged cotton called denim. This enormous roll contains 1,500 feet of fabric, from which they will produce 350 pairs of jeans. Several thicknesses of the material are unrolled on this long table. This knife can cut up to 100 thicknesses of the material at a time. By multiplying the thicknesses, they produce a whole pile of pieces with one cut. They shape the denim pieces following the cutting patterns. Each piece of the jeans has its own cutting pattern. The little pieces of fabric are cut with a clicker, also known as the stamper, which cuts out pockets with a cutting mold. Exerting 1,500 pounds of pressure, it can cut 20 pockets at a time. They begin sewing. Jeans are sewn with 100% cotton thread. This needle pierces the fabric 4,000 times a minute. Designs are embroidered on the pockets with this machine. Its needles move at 2,500 strokes per minute. This pocket robot will simultaneously fold, press, and sew a pocket. This machine allows for the installation of 75 pockets in 60 minutes. The pocket is now sewn into place. Next step, the buttonhole. This machine sews the contours of the buttonhole and a steel blade comes down to cut the opening. The closing button is positioned. This machine is used to make the loops which will hold the belt in place. The loops are sewn as usual with cotton thread. At this stage, they assemble the different pieces of the jeans. This operator joins the two pieces of denim at the crotch. Then she sews it. Then they sew the exterior of the leg. This sewing is done flat with an overcaster, which cuts excess material proportionately and to size. Now for the zipper. This machine installs the zipper holdfast and the slide. The zipper is sewn into its position. The final sewing step consists of installing the jeans belt, a strip of fabric. This operation requires only a few seconds. The jeans were made up on the reverse side, so that all stitches would be on the inside when the jeans are worn. The pant is then turned right side out with this turner, which has a 100 pound suction power. All that now remains is to steam press the jeans. This operation lasts only 20 seconds and eliminates any pleats. This company makes 1,500 jeans every day. Producing a pair of jeans will have taken 12 minutes and 50 seconds of work and will have required between 3.6 and 3.9 feet of fabric. 
There was a time when women wore silk stockings. Then came the invention of pantyhose, a cheaper, more convenient alternative. Pantyhose are knitted from strands of raw nylon. It's no stretch of the imagination to say that when they go on sale, there's usually a run on them. Making a nylon stocking takes only a few minutes. However, it's a complex operation that involves the knitting of five to eight threads as fine as a hair. The threads, usually nylon and spandex, are used along with elastic. Sometimes polyester or cotton are added. The knitting machine goes into action. This one fashions a tube for sheer stockings in 90 seconds. In three minutes, it makes a tube for tights. Its speed is adjusted according to the product being made, varying between 750 and 1200 revolutions per minute. Once the tube is knitted, it is sucked up and lands in a bag where it will be inspected. More than 500 machines share the work, each making a specific model. The two ends must now be joined. This automated machine assembles the two tubes together to form the pantyhose. Then, scissors cut the pantyhose, a necessary step in production of a pair. This opening is enlarged to allow for sewing, which will join the two tubes at the top of the leg. The label with a size or brand name is sewn in place in 10 seconds by this robotic machine. At this pace, it sews on 4,800 labels in eight hours. Installing a gusset requires some preparation. Scissors make a hole at the joining point. Then the stocking is turned inside out by suction, so certain stitching can be done on the inside. Thus, these stitches will be less visible. Now the foot must be sewn. This robotic machine places the foot in position. Then a sewing machine makes stitches at the same time it cuts away excess material. This step takes only 10 seconds. Then the pantyhose is turned right side out, again using suction. Everything is ready for installation of the gusset. The pantyhose is placed in a tub and taken to this department. The stocking is again suctioned and placed on a gusset machine by the operator. This method assures that the gusset will be well centered without a pleat. Putting in the gusset is the final operation in the process. A pre-cut piece of cotton is slid into the space reserved for the gusset and automatically sewn in. Only aesthetic touches remain, such as adding a little color to the pantyhose. They're placed in this machine, which has a large drum with four compartments and a 99-pound capacity. The pantyhose are washed in soapy water, then immersed in dye. Temperature climbs gradually to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. After a five-minute rinsing cycle, a softener is added. This process takes two and a half hours. Once dried, they proceed to inspection. The pantyhose is placed onto a form which stretches it to allow inspection for any imperfections. If all is well, the pantyhose is transferred onto another metal form where it will be pressed. The pantyhose's position is guided by a magic eye. The pantyhose is then carried toward a steam room where it will stay for two and a half seconds before being dried in seven and a half seconds at 280 degrees. They fold and pack 420 pantyhose per hour and make 180,000 pairs per day. Twisting plant or animal fibers into yarn dates back to ancient times when people fashioned primitive spindles out of sticks. 
Around 500 BC, the spinning wheel was born in India. Today's factories have fully automated spinning machines that work on the same principle as the spinning wheel. This is a two-ply commercial yarn, the kind factories use to weave fabric for making jeans and tops. It's made from large bales of raw cotton. Cotton comes from a plant, so naturally some leaves and stems are mixed in with the cotton fibers. To remove them, the first machine passes over the bales and removes a layer of cotton two-tenths of an inch wide. Then sends it through a duct system to the blending and cleaning machine. The machine processes half a ton of cotton per hour. The cotton comes out evenly blended and cleaner, but still not clean enough. So it goes into a second cleaning machine, which finishes the job. Now the cotton goes through what's called a carding machine. It has huge rollers with wire teeth. They comb out the tangled fibers and line them up in parallel rows. The machine also discards any fibers that are too short to process. Next stop, the coiler. This device takes the rows of fibers and forms them into a thick and loose first stage yarn called sliver. The slivers move on to the drawing machine. It lines them up six at a time and draws them out, stretching them to form a second stage yarn. Then a machine called a roving frame stretches this second stage yarn, strengthening it by thinning it out. Until it looks like this. This third stage yarn is called roving. Depending on the type of yarn they're making, it's anywhere from three and a half to 16 times thinner than sliver. They now stretch the roving up to 30 times thinner, which strengthens it even more. The yarn is finally finished. Now they have to transfer the yarn from all these small spools onto huge industrial size cones, 20 spools to a cone. One transfer method uses the winding machine. It winds the yarn from the first spool onto the cone. Then it automatically takes the back end of that yarn and attaches it with a knot to the front end of the yarn from the next spool. It winds it onto the cone, then attaches the back end to the front end from the next spool and so on. As each spool empties, the machine automatically discards it. And while all that winding's going on, the machine's optical sensor, that white object you see crossing the screen, does a quality control check. If a portion of yarn doesn't meet specifications, the winding stops, the machine cuts off the offending portion, then reconnects the ends and resumes winding. This is air jet spinning, another method of making yarn from slivers and winding it onto giant spools known as tubes. A suction tube grabs the front end of one spool and connects it to the back end of the previous one, again with a tiny knot. Before fully automated machines like this were invented 50 years ago, all that knotting had to be done by hand. The thin finished yarn is 200 times lighter than the thick first stage yarn that came out of the carding machine. From start to finish, spinning this yarn has taken 48 hours. The exact origins of the cotton plant are unknown although archaeologists have unearthed pieces of cotton cloth over 7,000 years old. Through the centuries, cotton fiber was traditionally processed by hand, 
until the early 18th century when the first automated processing machine was invented. Before cotton arrives at the textile mill to be spun into thread and woven into fabric, it makes the journey from field to bale. Cotton takes about five months to grow from a planted seed to a ripe plant. This harvesting machine, called a cotton picker, plucks fluffy seed cotton out of the plant's bowl, leaving a trail of burrs and sticks behind. The machine empties the plucked cotton into a tractor-drawn buggy. This machine builds the seed cotton into a humongous rectangular block called a module. A truck transports the module to the processing plant, known as a cotton gin. Once the cotton arrives to the processing plant, sticks and burrs are removed, as well as any lingering debris and seeds. A truck dumps the module into a feeder, which moves the packed seed cotton into a dispenser. The ground seed cotton falls onto a conveyor belt, which leads to the hot box. The hot box mixes the seed cotton with hot air, which allows the moisture to evaporate, making the seed cotton easier to clean. A machine called the wad buster breaks up the clumps of seed cotton by tossing it against a screen. Loose debris falls through the screen openings down a narrow chute. Then the seed cotton moves through a machine called the steady flow, which divides it equally between two processing lines. On each line, the seed cotton enters a burr machine, which grabs the seed cotton with a circular saw and swings it against metal bars. The centrifugal force shakes off the heavier debris. The seed cotton exits the machine through one pipe and the debris through another. A large auger transfers the debris to a waste chute and out of the plant. The seed cotton is ready for the final stage of processing. A network of pipes feeds a row of machines called gin stands. The gin stand separates the seed from the fluffy stuff called the lint. Inside each stand are 116 circular saws, which are arranged horizontally, each separated by a steel rib. The saw teeth grab the seed cotton and pull the lint through the narrow gap between saw and rib. The seeds are too large to pass through, so it spins in front of the rib, then drops into a conveyor. The lint goes into a flue, which leads to the packing area. Cotton seed is sold as livestock feed, particularly for dairy cows. It contains 23% protein, 20% fat, and 25% fiber. Cotton seed is also milled into cottonseed oil, a cooking oil that's a common ingredient in salad dressings and mayonnaise. The cotton lint is now ready to be formed into bales. Pipes feed the loose lint to the press area. When it arrives, a pusher moves the lint into a machine called the tramper, which shoves it down into a bale-shaped box. Once the box reaches 500 pounds of cotton lint, a press compacts the lint and tie wraps the bale. Next, a conveyor moves the bale to a bagging machine and past grippers, which pull a sample from each side. While the bale slides into a protective plastic bag, the grippers deposit the sample into a bin. Technicians label the bale with an ID number, then open the bin to retrieve the corresponding sample. Then the sample is bagged and labeled with the bale ID number. The factory submits the sample to the United States Department of Agriculture, where it's analyzed for fiber length, cleanliness, color, and other criteria. Once the analysis is complete, the bale is given a grade and processed accordingly. The bison is blessed with the perfect winter coat. 
And now bison fibers are helping people to endure the cold too. Processed with polyester strands, the fibers are made into insulation for winter coats, allowing people to hunker down in frigid winter temperatures. These winter coats have been insulated with bison fiber fill. It's a byproduct of bison ranching and a garment insulation that's no longer going to waste. Bison fiber fill is a combination of the animal's coarse guard hairs, bison down, recycled and low melt polyester. Technicians load the four fibers separately into spiked conveyors. The fibers were compressed for shipping so as they're loaded, the fibers are loosened by hand. Once loading is complete, an operator turns on the conveyors. The conveyors protruding pins snag the bison and polyester strands and transport them upward. The strands travel under rotating spiked cylinders. The cylinders comb the fibers to open them up and detangle them. The four different fibers flow into scales which weigh equal portions and are released. The fibers drop onto a conveyor and move into a blender for mixing. Another vertical conveyor with pins picks up the fibers and takes them upward past revolving bars that knock off the excess. This ensures an even mass as the bison and polyester fibers move between a series of different wire-covered rollers. This process arranges the fibers in a parallel orientation and gets rid of any clumps. A comb further aligns the bison and polyester fibers. The fibers cling together in a web. The web transfers to a wooden slat conveyor. A vacuum suctions up loose fibers to be recycled back into production. An oscillating conveyor layers the fibers in a zigzag pattern called cross-lapping. Cross-lapping produces a substantial mat, and it also mixes the fibers. Next, the web lands on another conveyor, passing between a series of rollers that compress it. This process gives the mixed fibers the appropriate mass and height to produce a uniform bat. A sprayer applies an adhesive to the bison and polyester insulation. The adhesive doesn't take right away. It will need to be heat activated. The insulation moves into a 300 degree oven, which triggers the activation. The heat also activates the low melt polyester strands in the insulation. This bonds the interlaced fibers to prevent them from migrating through fabric when used as fill. Next, the insulation heads downward into a shearing. Like a pizza cutter, circular blades cut through the center of the insulation mat and trim along the edges. Rollers wind the strips of bison fiber and polyester insulation together Using a paper cutter, an inspector cuts a sample to a specific size. He weighs the sample and confirms that it's adequate for the size, verifying the density of the fiber mass. Next, he measures the sample's thickness. At about 0.13 inches, the fiber fill will provide warmth without a lot of bulk. The team slices the bison fiber fabric fill to its specified length using a hot wire. Once the roll is complete, they start rolling the next one. The bison fiber rolls are put in plastic bags for protection during transport to outside clothing factories. Technicians weigh each bag separately. After several hours, Bison fibers and polyester strands have been transformed into moisture-wicking insulation. Stuffed inside a jacket liner, this bison fiber insulation won't be seen, but on a winter day, its presence will definitely be felt.
As anyone who's shivered through a cold winter knows, you've got your run-of-the-mill winter jackets. And then those really warm winter jackets that can run up to $1,000. The difference is what they're made of and how they're made. A top-of-the-line winter jacket gives you the warmth without the weight. It's waterproof and comfortable. No bulky stuffing or constrictive styling. The designer draws a pattern by computer. A software program then adapts the pattern to different sizes. A giant printer puts it to paper. The tailor spreads out several layers of each of the fabrics that'll make up the jacket. He lays out the pattern, then pins it in place. Next, he cuts through several layers of fabric at a time with electric scissors. These scissors maneuver much like a jigsaw around the lines and curves of the pattern pieces. The finished jacket will actually be made up of two jackets sewn together, an insulation jacket on the inside and a windbreaker on the outside. The inner insulation jacket begins with a nylon lining. Then they layer the key components, a film to stabilize and protect the insulation, then the thick polyester insulation itself. At this point, the insulation layer is larger than the lining. This ensures that every inch of the jacket will have insulation. Working with one piece at a time, they stitch the layers together. Each line of stitching is tacked at the beginning and at the end for added strength. They cut off the excess insulation, then sew an overlock around each piece to hold the remaining insulation solidly in place. Once they've completed each piece of the insulation jacket, they sew it all together. Next step, the windbreaker. The outer fabric is heavy nylon. The lining is a special fabric with tiny holes, large enough to let humidity escape but small enough to stop water droplets and wind from penetrating. This is what will allow the jacket to breathe, while at the same time making it windproof and waterproof. Finally, it's time to put the two jacket components together. Using two separate strong threads, they sew seams made of knotted stitches. No seams go through the jacket because that would break the insulation barrier and let in cold air. They join the two jackets together only where they have to, at the collar, the cuffs, the hem, and along the zipper. And this isn't any ordinary zipper. It's made of corrosion-resistant nylon with a nickel-plated slider that lasts seven times longer than a normal slider. Until now, they've been sewing the jacket turned inside out. Now they turn it right side in for finishing. These heavy-duty snaps have sturdy grips that anchor themselves between the fibers in the material so they won't tear the fabric with repeated use. Some jackets have decorative embroidery. Designers use a computer program to prepare the pattern. The automatic machine embroiders five jackets at once. This intricate owl pattern takes one and a quarter hours to complete. The final result is a stylish jacket whose secret weapon is that hidden layer of insulation. It traps air inside your body, then heats it up, creating a cushion of warmth against the cold of winter.